by the way, your, your cartoon is perfect. And it actually, that's my punchline right there. So I could, I could stop right now. But Lori's going to fire up something for us. Do you want to watch the video first? Let's watch the, well, actually, let me, let me preface it for one second. Was it, Trevor, was it about nine months ago that you and I and Peter had lunch? And um, Peter said, Ken, I have this conference for accountants, and I'd like to have you talk about forecasting. And I was so startled by this strange request that I immediately started choking. And Trevor, being quick on his feet, jumped up and slapped me on the back and was about to administer the Heimlich maneuver. I recovered my composure. I said, Peter, I apologize. I choked on a fish bone. But that was actually a little white lie. I was so taken aback by the idea that accountants would actually want to forecast that it took me back 35 years to something I'd seen on TV. So Lori, hit it. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. So that's what I thought of when Peter uh, asked me to come and talk about forecasting. But here I am. And, and so the, 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 the question I'm going to ask of you all or, or pose to you all is, if you really want to forecast, to what extent is this something that is a rules-based kind of process? Uh, and to what extent do we need judgment? And um, what I'll talk about this morning is, uh, comes from this book I've just published. As um, you know, as you know, Nassim Taleb popularized this idea of black swans, which are these seemingly unpredictable events that turn out to be massive and consequential surprises. Uh, we all appear to have experienced one in the last uh, two or three years with the global economic downturn. As an analyst covering the, especially finance sector for about 15 years, I saw black swans impacting individual companies or sectors, even when the rest of the market was calm, and I struggled with this volatility. And that's what led, uh, that and, and the combination of, of the events in the last couple of years led me to write this book. And the goal is to offer decision makers and analysts and other people some tools for anticipating or predicting in some cases, or if not that, at least reacting to black swans uh, so that we can make the best decisions that we can in, this, in an environment where there may be such uh, surprises. So what I thought I would talk about today is um, a quick introduction to the idea of black swans and um, discuss some of their causes. Uh, and then I'll spend uh, most of the time talking about the subprime uh, mortgage crash as an example of a failure in forecasting. So if Peter is right, and uh, and, and people here really do want to uh, get into the art of forecasting, it would be important to do better than the various mortgage companies and regulators and investors and other people did with respect to anticipating this crisis, which has um, uh, distracted everybody uh, over the last couple of years, as it has. And then finally, as I said, I want to end um, on the topic of judgment, because I think judgment uh, is critical to forecasting. And any effort at forecasting that doesn't take into account the role of judgment is probably going to be something that Trevor would give little credit for in his class, that idea of just using the percentage of revenues and not putting any more thought into it than that. So um, let's talk about uh, black swans for a second. And um, by the way, this isn't actually a black swan I'm showing you here. Since I have a very low budget, this is actually a black goose. I found a goose and I colored it black and it seemed to work. Um, a black swan is a, it's a surprise and it's impactful and it seemingly could not have been predicted. 
the idea is that Europeans were surprised when they finally discovered black swans in Australia because they had only ever seen white swans before, so they couldn't imagine that there might be something different. In the markets, if you see a stock or other security move by, let's say, more than three or four standard deviations, I mean, a three or four standard de deviation event is supposed to be once in 1,000 years or 10,000 years. And so if you see that, that's a black swan. That's a good working definition of a black swan. It doesn't have to be the global economy. It could be an individual company. Where do black swans come from? Now, I, I saw from the agenda that you had people talking about weather and perhaps earthquakes. And so they've already made the point that the fundamental world can be very complex. And so surprises can come from the fact that the weather is nonlinear and, and thus difficult to predict. You have no doubt heard other people, like Robert Schiller, talk about how the markets are excessively volatile, or they may be excessively volatile. It's hard to tell, actually. But you could have surprises coming from excessive market volatility. I would like to highlight to your attention one potential source of black swans, which not everybody thinks about, and that is the interaction between the markets and the fundamental world. Now, you may say, what is this interaction? Because don't markets discount information about the fundamental world? I mean, that's how we normally think of it. And that's true, but markets can also influence the fundamental world. And that sets you up for a potential positive feedback loop. And a feedback loop, now I guess it won't work with this microphone because uh, they figured out how to stop these things, but feedback loops is, you know, can produce extreme outcomes, which um, could in fact be the source uh, of a black swan kind of surprise that might mess up what would otherwise be an accurate forecast. So that's one source of black swans I want to mention. Let me uh, mention a second potential source of black swans. Now, as we all know, computer power is a big deal in our world today, and it wasn't 50 years ago. Uh, and in fact, some people like Ray Kurzweil point out that computer power is in fact still accelerating in terms of processing power and, and memory and bandwidth. So we haven't seen the full impact of what computer power is going to do to the world. Wall Street has invested billions and billions of dollars in high-speed computers. And we're going to talk about them in a second. It, it makes you wonder, you know, how much value we should place on human qualities like intuition or judgment or, um, or, or, or other kinds of deliberation. And certainly we hear that behavioralists criticize people for being overconfident and irrational. So you might wonder whether forecasting is really something that we're not going to do as accountants, but rather what, uh, something that computers will do. Now, I'd like to read you a quote here. And I'd, I'd like actually to, to ask you whether you agree with this or not. So I'll ask you that in a second. I'll read it to you, though. This is from Reed Hasty and Robin Dawes, who I am led to believe are well-regarded researchers in the field of psychology and behavioralism. And they say an enormous and almost unequivocal research literature implies that expert judgments are rarely impressively accurate and virtually never better than a mechanical judgment rule. So they recommend, whenever possible, human judges should be replaced by simple linear models. If they're right, if they're right then Peter you know, certainly made a mistake in bringing me to talk to you. you none of us are actually going to do forecasting, right? We'll just be replaced by simple linear models. So let me ask a question. Just by a show of hands, how many people think this is broadly correct? And how many people think this is incorrect? Just curious, how many people agree with this statement? OK, so we've got about five or six. How many people disagree with this statement? Okay, so we have a, a, a larger number. You know, there's no doubt that there are certain situations where this is correct. Um, uh, so, for example, in, in underwriting, uh, sometimes computers are more systematic and do a better job than people. I'm going to suggest to you that following mechanical, uh, linear mechanical judgment rules is, in fact, a second potential source of black swan surprises, and therefore something that as you take on forecasting projects, you will have to be mindful of. Okay, causes of black swans number three, I'd like to talk about the efficient um, market hypothesis, which, as you know, is associated with Gene Fama uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, and according to the efficient market uh, theory, 
all information is discounted in the market, and therefore you can't um, beat the market. Uh, now, Peter didn't say that you were interested in forecasting markets. I mean, maybe you're interested in forecasting whether the sun will rise tomorrow or not. I mean, there are things that are truly simple to forecast. But um, if you want to forecast anything that's connected with markets or the business world, to some extent, Fama is saying, well, you can't really do that. Um, I think the efficient market theory or the widespread popularity of this theory is also a contributor to black swan surprises. Because what has happened as the academic world over the last 50 years has been enthralled with the efficient market hypothesis, it has largely ignored the study of fundamental research, which Ben Graham, who I show here, and David Dodd are associated with. They were wrote about uh, fundamental research in the 30s and 40s. Warren Buffett and others point to Graham as a mentor. Um, but generally speaking, uh, fundamental research has slipped into obscurity as a serious field of research. Now, people often think about fundamental research as a form of value investing, buying cheap stocks or financial statement analysis. But I'd like to suggest that fundamental research is really about the study of causative variables. The variables that an analyst or an accountant would use to forecast future developments in a company or an industry or even perhaps an economy. By the way, we can, I don't think the efficient market theory actually makes sense mathematically. Uh, not that my opinion matters much on that topic. Uh, so we can talk about that if you're interested, but I think failure to understand underlying causative variables is most certainly a cause of forecasting mistakes and therefore black swan surprises. So um, let's now talk about this big crash we've been through. As an analyst, I had a ringside seat since I covered Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Countrywide and many others who were at ground zero for this big uh, event we've just been through. Um, and there were clearly mistakes made, and I don't want to approach this from a negative perspective, but I want to help us all draw the right lessons so that going forward, uh, people, accountants, analysts, and others can make more accurate forecasts. And that's what the book is about, various techniques for making more accurate forecasts when there is a possibility of black swans. So I, what I propose to do is tell you uh, three stories, and, and if, if I go too quickly, feel free to stop me. Some of this, I've tried to make it simple, but as you know, you know, securitizations and tranches and stuff like that can get complicated. So feel free to stop me. I've got three different stories in here, and if we run out of time, I can just uh, skip the last one and, and wrap it up. So we've got some flexibility here. The um, what do you hear when you open, turn on the radio, or open, or read the newspapers about the crash? The crash was caused by what? Greed. Foolish investors, lax regulation. Those are some of the common um, factors that people blame. I don't think that's a particularly convincing explanation. I've been on Wall Street for 15 years. I never noticed that people got more greedy or more foolish in the last few years. I think greed and foolishness and lax regulation are constant. So I don't think they really explain the crisis per se, although obviously they played a role, they always do. As I said, I think the crisis is more about a failure in forecasting. So let's talk about how the mortgage industry and the capital markets industry actually forecast um, what was going to happen to home prices and mortgage credit quality. And I'm here to tell you it was a really high-tech exercise. And not only plenty of computers, um, but analysts with PhDs in statistics, all the right credentials, who knew what they were doing. Uh, lots of data, data on mortgages stretching back for years and years and years, and, and data about the borrowers and the home prices. So the ability to make, to use all the modern tools of statistics to make what should be accurate forecasts of loss rates. And what I show you here is a representation of the first generation of this model. Sim simply put, People forecasted loss rates on subprime mortgages as a function of some pretty obvious loan characteristics. What was the borrower's credit score? If it was higher, you know, you'd expect a higher loss rate. Sorry, if it was lower, 
what was the loan to value on the house or on the mortgage and some other common sense variable. Now, I've represented this model with these two circles and the arrows. That is actually um, meant to be an what's called an influence diagram or uh, some people call it a Bayesian network. It's meant to show the cause and effect relationship that underlies these models. So it's very simple. Loan characteristics were thought to cause or influence the outcome, which was credit losses. So let me ask you guys a question. Do you think this is a complete representation of the cause and effect? Does anybody have some ideas about other causal variables that might have been appropriate to consider here? Yes, sir. So the, the answer was um, feedback, right? That could affect um, how these variables play together, and that's absolutely correct. Um, I show you this in the next slide. Uh, as, as time went by and it became clear that the ho housing market was booming at an unsustainable level, by the way, you know, everybody knew that housing couldn't continue rising forever. Um, the people running these models began to add macro factors like home prices. And so I've represented it with a more complex influence diagram here. You can see both home prices and loan characteristics were thought to influence the loss rates that would be experienced on mortgages, subprime mortgages. The idea being that if home prices are rising, of course, somebody who gets into trouble can sell their house for a profit. And therefore, there's likely to be a very small loss if there is one at all. And conversely, if home prices fall, then the lender is certain to, to take a bigger hit. Now, today, as I said, people look back and say, how could the mortgage industry have been so greedy, so stupid? Didn't they know? And the answer is, of course, everybody knew. And we all, and they all, everybody was watching this very carefully. So there's a chart on the uh, right here uh, from a report I actually wrote in, I think, early 2006. This is how people were watching things. And it's hard to see the numbers. The vertical axis is the cumulative losses that pools of subprime mortgages were experiencing. And the bottom axis is the cumulative home price change uh, in the regions where those loans were originated over the last two years. So you can see that in parts of the country, I don't know if you can see the zero, but uh, in parts of the country where home prices have been flat, which would have been the Midwest, uh, losses had gotten as high as you know, three and a half percent. Um, but conversely, on the far end, where home prices have been rising strongly, like California and Florida, losses were basically zero. So I think back in 2005 and 2006, the general viewpoint, and again, this is coming from credit risk experts who have staffs of PhDs with statistics, degrees in statistics, Big computers, lots of data, and the knowledge to do this kind of model in the right way. They thought that subprime losses, which were running in the 0 to 3% range, would normalize as the housing market slowed to around 5%. And maybe if some of the feedback effects were difficult, maybe they'd be as high as 7%. And as we now know, um, in fact, those losses turned out to be 35 to 40%. So Peter didn't say that you all were interested in making accurate forecasts, but I would hope that the goal would be not to be as stunningly wrong as all these smart people were with respect to these products. And I, I, I sort of liken that difference between 5 to 7% as a standard deviation. So this could be potentially thought of as a 22 standard deviation uh, mistake, despite all the resources that went into the exercise. Well, we don't want to make those kinds of mistakes. Why? What was the mistake? And this gentleman here mentioned the idea of feedbacks. The underlying causal drivers of the housing boom and the credit boom were not <coughs> understood. And what people missed in particular is the kind of feedback effect that drives every credit cycle. By the way, there have been countless credit cycles since the beginning of finance. But that information did not register with the people who were building the models and making decisions. What happens in a credit cycle is that there's a missing variable 
called liquidity. And you can, look, you can say it was savers in, in Asia and a glut of liquidity from, from that region, or you can blame Greenspan for keeping rates too low, whatever you want. The fact is, a lot of liquidity was looking for assets with yield. And as home prices went up and subprime losses were lower than expected, the subprime mortgage bonds began to look extremely attractive. And that attracted this liquidity, which made mortgages more affordable. And that got more people into homes and increased the demand for housing, pushing home prices up further. And that virtuous cycle produced the boom. But the problem with this kind of cycle, as you can imagine, it only can go as far as it can go. Once rates started going up, it went into reverse. And as home prices fell, um, the losses went up and the liquidity withdrew from the market, thus reducing the demand for housing and making things worse. There are other feedback loops here too. I only pictured one, but another one that was problematic was the fact that the lenders really struggled with falling volumes. And so they began, that competitive pressure forced them to cut corners on the underwriting quality. So the loan characteristics actually got worse than they would have been otherwise. And that made things worse. And then there were other feedback effects, the bigger ones, right? The fact that housing has an effect on the economy. And as the capital markets recoiled in horror from 35 to 40% loss rates, where only five to seven had been expected, uh, the global capital markets shut down, financial institutions became impaired, and the problem became enormous, which of course made home prices worse, and so forth, and so on. So this is, a, to, to me, a very important example of a process that would be very hard to model in a closed form mathematical set of relationships. But if you understood these kinds of feedback effects, you might have had a chance of being more right and less wrong than in fact a lot of people were. Now, this is a source, this is a great example of a black swan. And, but I wanna take a step back, because it's actually a, a, it's, it's a little bit of a bigger problem than just that. Um, this idea of markets and fundamentals interacting. That's what we just looked at. Because remember, the, glo the, the glut of liquidity flowing into the markets affected real fundamental assets, home prices. Um, it's that interaction. One of the problems with the market economy is that it operates through a great crowd of people. Think about the capital markets, investors in Asia, mortgage lenders in the US, rating agencies, consumers, brokers, investors in other parts of the world too. Nobody's in charge, right? Nobody knows the whole big picture, and they can't. You couldn't expect any single person to understand what the collective activity of all their peers is. So this idea of the crowd is the root cause of all credit cycles, and thus many kinds of black swans. And I think there's a fundamental mathematical reality here. Since a part can't understand a whole system, there's always gonna be a limitation to what we can do. There's this time lag, right, in other words. There's a time lag between the market's impact on the fundamental world and the market's recognition of what it has collectively done. And during that time lag, bad decisions get made, which makes things worse. So that's the world we live in. And that's why I don't think, by the way, we should look for regulators or politicians to save us. It's the price we pay for innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity. So I think that's the real story of this crash and many other crashes in these capital markets. Now I wanna keep going and talk about a couple of other mistakes that were made, and these all pertain to the subject of forecasting again. I mentioned Ben Graham and fundamental research earlier, and I think you guys probably know that some of the best known value investors got into real trouble in this crash. What is value investing? It's the idea that you look for very cheap stocks because perhaps the market is underpricing. I know a number of famous value investors who saw financials get cheap during the crisis in 2007 and 2008. So they backed up the truck and they bought Lehman and Fannie Mae and Bear Stearns. And the problem is they just got cheaper and cheaper after that. The problem with value investing is that it's really a mechanical judgment rule. Buy stocks if they're cheap, if they're below book value. That's a mechanical rule. 
the people who followed that rule and didn't understand the positive variables at, fa at play in the global crisis made very poor forecasts and very poor, de poor decisions. But it wasn't just these value investors. You know, a lot of them are like Warren Buffett and they're sort of folksy and they talk about Mr. Market this and Mr. Market that. Um, this mistake of following mechanical adjustment rules was actually replicated by the fully quantitative investing industry. Fully quantitative investing is, by the way, or was, one of the biggest, or I should say this, the fastest growing niches in the alternative investing market. And as you know, these are secretive organizations like Renaissance and Goldman Sachs and others that have, again, the staffs of PhDs, and they program computer models to execute certain kinds of strategies. But computers operate so quickly that they buy and sell without human intervention. And this, these strategies, sorry, I lost the axis on this chart. They produced very steady, very good returns for many years until August 2007 when these strategies in total produced 30% losses in the space of two days. That's called the quant quake uh, of August 2007. You know what? They were following, in many cases, the same rules as the value investor, buying cheap stocks. Instead of having a two to three year holding period, they might have had a two to three minute holding period. But it was the same principle. They were replicating mechanical judgment rules just at a speed which humans obviously couldn't. And mechanical judgment rules can break down uh, rather spectacularly. By the way, the um, fully quantitative investing niche, it's here to stay and it's still growing, but it lost half its assets in the wake of the quant quake through losses and then redemption. But there was a critical point here because you know the human principles behind these strategies in the first or second week of August, they had a decision to make when <laughs> their models produced 30% losses in two days. They said, do we pull out or do we double down? Actually, those that doubled down um, recouped most of their losses. But that decision, abort or double down, that's a decision you couldn't make with a model, right? The model had just produced stunning losses. That was a judgment call. And that's where we'll end up in my presentation, talking about the importance of judgment. Um, by the way, Ben Graham would not have been surprised by the outcome uh, in either of these cases. I won't read this whole quote to you. But he had come up with a formula to predict the stock market, and it worked really well until it didn't. And he said, the advent of popularity marked almost the exact moment when the system ceased to work well. What he pointed out is that if a trading system, which could be value investing, or you know growth or whatever, or it could be the rules programmed into quantitative investing, when it becomes too popular, it stops working because everybody's following it. And uh, then the, mar the, the rule gets ineffective counted into the market. So I don't think he would have been surprised by either the value investors or the fully quantitative strategies that class. I've got one last uh, story for you from the crash. And again, I hope I'm not coming across as negative, picking on mistakes that people made. And we'll end with some positive suggestions. But you know this crisis gives us a really rich vein of material to mine in terms of learning how to make better forecasts going forward. So I'd like to talk a little bit about countrywide versus the hedge fund briefly. And um, I spent a number of years covering countrywide. And you know, today, if you say countrywide, somebody might just spit in your face, right? It's the personification of a bad actor. Uh, in this crisis, which is, I'm not here to defend Countrywide, <laughs> but uh, you know that's not how they were thought of before the crash. Uh, and in fact, Countrywide was a black swan, a good black swan. You know, its stock price quadrupled from 1991 to 2001. The reason for that, you know, Countrywide is really the story of the little company, the little company that could. It was founded, I think, in the 60s, and it survived against all the odds over a number of years. What I mean by against all the odds, it wasn't a bank. You know, it's a little, it was a little pipsqueak of a company versus the JP Morgans and the Wells Fargo's of the world. But the, what they had was they had management that I think was to a certain extent visionary about development of the industry, at least until the crash. They were driven. They seized technology and developed proprietary systems 
Um, people thought they were just the smartest, sharpest operators in the mortgage industry. And because of their investments in technology and because they were continually adjusting their business model and because they had a disciplined strategic planning process where they would set five-year goals and then achieve them, when um, the Fed cut rates in 2001 and we had a big refinance boom, Countrywide was poised and that was its moment in the sun. And they did such a great job uh, in, in that refi boom that they vaulted past Wells Fargo and became the country's number one mortgage originator and servicer. Now, they did some subprime loans, but they really didn't do that much of them. Uh, I remember in 1997, somebody told me, Ken, Countrywide's a great company, but they've missed the subprime train, and they are going to become irrelevant. That was in 1997. In fact, the company was very slow, very careful, very methodical, very quantitative, and they got into subprime lending only about 10 years later, and in a small way. So this was the rise of Countrywide, but as you know, it didn't end well. And in the company's five-year strategic plan, they accurately foresaw continued consolidation in the mortgage industry. And so they thought it was important to defend their hard-won market share. And part of their market share was subprime and Alt-A and option arms. And in 2007, when the securitization market started to wobble, which you can see, see in the ABX triple B tranche prices, as the, the capital markets began to, to wobble, Countrywide had a choice. They either could back out of those risky loans or they could put them on their balance sheet for a few months pending a return of the market's normalcy. And they decided to put the loans on their balance sheet and defend that market share and stay relevant. Well, that was a mistake. Their stock price sold off, their debt spreads widened. I talked to them at that time and I said, guys, you probably don't want to be risking up your balance sheet right now. And they said, no, our stock price is being manipulated by short sellers. They lashed out, sign of cognitive dissonance. That's, that's something I actually talk about in the book. I have a whole chapter on it. And the 10 billion or so in loans that they did in July 2007, that became a fatal liquidity drain because those loans could never in fact be sold. And Countrywide was only acquired for $2 a share by Bank of America, uh, otherwise they would have failed. Now, I wanna contrast the fall of this company, which was the number one operator in its segment, with the incredible success of a small number of hedge funds. Now, you, you guys have read The Big Short by Michael Lewis, about Steve Eisman, right, who we all know, Morgan Stanley purchase. Uh, or um, about John Paulson, right? So how did these small hedge funds with a couple of guys and gals and none of the resources of a countrywide head, by the way, it wasn't just countrywide. Countrywide made the same mistake as Fannie Mae, made the same mistake as Freddie Mac, AIG, Moody's, the regulators, um, Washington Mutual, I mean, it was all the same mistake. What did these hedge funds do? Well, it's back to Trevor's cartoon, which encapsulated my whole presentation. They reacted intuitively to a couple of trends, which in hindsight now are pretty obvious. I think Paulson, is, uh, um, as I understand it, one of his partners said, look at this chart of home prices, this isn't sustainable. An intuitive judgment. Or there was a fellow that I chronicle in, in my book at a different hedge fund who had seen credit crises in emerging markets economies and recognized the outline of the potential for credit cycles. Um, that was the difference. These companies were able to react intuitively to new information, whereas the countrywides and the institutions of the world were not able to. So let's talk about how we all as a, analysts and accountants um, can incorporate these lessons into our forecasting methodology. This is a very sophisticated uh, strategy here. So you see, uh, having talked a little bit about computers and human skills, you know, it's not an either or question, right? But what I'm trying to get across with this silly little picture is that using your intuition, 
uh, is going to be, in fact, critically important to your forecasting uh, process. By the way, um, the intuition, the human brain is substantially more powerful than t today's computers, at least measured in some dimension, not with respect to precision, although you know there are some people who are extremely precise, able to multiply huge numbers in their heads, but the brain has 100 trillion roughly intraneural connections, and no computer comes even close to that for now. That'll change. And so when it comes to conceptual reasoning and understanding causative variables, the computer can't do that at all. So I think to some extent the problems at Countrywide and all the big institutions is that the modeling had become such a big process. By the way, it wasn't just the statistical models. Even the five-year strategic planning process is sort of a process, a model. That, that was maybe the front of the train instead of being the back of the train. And the institutions lost the ability to adjust their forecasts quickly as new information surfaced. Um, and that's something the hedge funds uh, didn't have. So uh, let me wrap up here. Uh, the and by the way, I'm an accountant too. So you know the challenge for all of us, if we really want to forecast, is to recognize that forecasting is a different kind of animal from the kind of rules-based processing, which in fact is the bedrock of accountancy, right? So um, it's a different animal, and thus um, a couple different processes are, are, are important. I want to talk a little bit about judgment, and then I'll wrap up and see if you guys have any questions. The judgment, I think, historically, people talk about as a weighing of pros and cons. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, weighing pros and cons is actually incredibly difficult. So I've listed a number of questions here. You know, how would you pick what are the right pros and cons to weigh? How would you weight them? What happens if there are correlations among the factors? What happens if there are asymmetric outcomes? As your list of pros and cons becomes bigger and more complicated, how do you manage that? How do you know if you're using your human intuitive powers properly and not falling victim to the overconfidence and biases that behavioralists warn about? And how do you know that this process will even work? I don't know if there are any mathematicians in the audience, but in an open system, no mechanical judgment rule can be counted on to produce the right answer. That's uh, actually known as the hulking problem. That was something that uh, mathematicians came to grips with in the 1930s. So I, what I'm going to leave you with is not going to be particularly helpful to you, but if you do really want to do forecasting, I'm going to suggest thinking of uh, judgment, which is, a, I think, a critical ingredient in decision-making, as a continual process of analyzing your analysis or continually looking at your mechanical rules and seeing if they're right. And we talked about fundamental research, i.e., the the search for causative variables. What Trevor was saying is that if anybody comes in with a forecast that says, well, the margins were X, so they're going to be X. The growth rate was X, so it's going to be X. That's not what a forecast is. A forecast starts with causal drivers. We talked about black swans and recognizing the potential. You're probably not going to model a credit cycle precisely, but if you recognize the potential for feedback effects, then your forecast is more likely to be in the right ballpark. We talked about monitoring the competition because you know, that doesn't matter. If we all forecast the sun rising tomorrow at 642, that's probably not going to have any feedback effect on the sun's actual rise miles. But in any kind of collective endeavor, business, markets, to the extent that everybody is using similar mechanical judgment rules, that can have an impact on what happens. And then, as I said, the continual readjustments. There's no, you know, after all, any silver bullet for any of this stuff, but you need to be committed to continually adjusting and refining, and uh, sometimes very quickly. If, and I want to leave you with that point, if there are, in fact, black swans in the environment, then for your forecast to be accurate, this process of continually adjusting will need to be very, very fast. So that's it for me, and I would love to take any questions uh, from you guys if you have them. Uh, Greg has a question, if you can go to the microphone. Um, while Greg's going to the microphone, I just want to um, make sure at some stage we get to this. So can you 
um, given us a sort of what I would call a descriptive explanation. But uh, before you leave, I would like you to actually um, tell people how you actually did it mm -hmm. and to what extent you believe what you did worked or didn't work uh, because you did complex models and frankly many of them failed mm -hmm. as I know you believe so great so I get a reprieve on that as long as I get to answer Greg's question first it's no easier <laughs> uh oh so my background I uh, have And, and now he's at Morgan Stanley, just then. <laughs> and he's smart, so he doesn't see his shorts as well. Um, two questions, one about tasks, uh, and, and then one about applying the lessons from the people who gave us to the people. So about the tasks, I, I wonder to what extent you believe that, that another causal event of the credit crisis is bad data. So um, the question about data and bad data, I think, is important. And, and I didn't mention that here, but I do think um, that is one of the causes, of potential causes of black swans. In fact, I've got a chapter in the book on information asymmetry. And so what I point to in that chapter is the bad data that comes from management. Or not the bad data, bad information that may come from management teams that have a vested interest in um, promoting a certain way of thinking about a company or a stock price. And so that chapter provides suggestions on how to structure interviews so that you can actually get at the underlying issue. But uh, you know, blaming data, you can certainly do it. And it reminds me of the, 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 the problems people have with rationality. You know, Herbert Simon said, we suffer from bounded rationality, right? The idea we, we, we can't know and think about everything. But you know, there's sort of a, an idea that if it weren't for that bound, our rationality would be infinite, right, or perfect. And that obviously doesn't make any sense. So it's sort of the same issue with data. Yes, if the alternative were to have infinite and perfect data, uh, and presumably you would only then have the challenge of processing it. But um, the, the problem is there is, in fact, an infinite amount of data in the world. And you have to make decisions about where to go to get it and what to spend in terms of time and other resources. So yeah, with hindsight, you could say those folks who actually went out and talked to home built owners and realized that they, you know, um, they didn't uh, know how their mortgage worked or something like that, they might have gotten an in, you know, some, some value out of that. But I, I would counter and say, look, this industry had a phenomenal amount of data and most of it was um, impressive relative to what had happened in the past. So yeah, with hindsight, we could, we could say you should have had this data or that data, or you shouldn't have trusted this data, but the industry is drowning in data. In fact, the, you know, there are databases on loans, and this is all factual stuff, whether somebody is paying or not, and what their credit score was, and what their social security number is. And you know, these 
databases amount to the gigabytes of information. So it certainly wasn't this question of not enough data. And things like home prices, I mean, that's not, you know, that's a, that's a transaction. So again, that's data, that's recorded. By the way, this, this focus on data, the little company I'm in, one of our investors spends a million dollars a year getting information on home prices. They have credit scores, they have social security numbers, they can tell you, you know, everything about a person and a house, and it's just a question of where you're gonna spend your money over time. So I'm pushing back a little bit on you, but let's hear your second, your second question. The second question is now about speed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's gonna be easier. Okay. And it's trying to apply your lessons mm -hmm. to a situation like an attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you have any concern about following the scenario, because I see my perception is my hypothesis saying there's a repeat of what we just saw. Well, that's no good. Okay, yeah. so it's my impression Finally, my point about bad data, and I don't know what you all think about governmental accounting right. as to whether you know, we're really getting the story here. Yeah. But it seems to me I've seen I think I'm on your side on this one. I've <laughs> seen this picture before, so now apply your rules to what I believe to be the situation, and I'm not just talking Greece. Oh, I was thought you were talking Greece. Well, you know, because I was going to say, huh, a run on a sovereign. I don't know. Maybe that could happen. Um, maybe it is happening. What you really meant was a run on a big sovereign, right? Not a little tiny one. Uh, so definitely, yes, well, I agree with everything you're saying. Back to bad data. See, it's not the question of, see, with Greece, it was misleading data. They fudged the numbers. That's an information asymmetry. That's like the manager of the company telling you that everything is great when it's not. That's definitely a source of black swans. I'll give you an example. A credit card company called Capital One. Don't tell me I told you this, but it's public. Um, 2002, they said, Two questions, our subprime portfolio, oh, it's small, don't worry about it, it's doing great. Then they disclosed that they were had been subject to a memorandum of understanding with their regulator. Stock price dropped by 50% in two days. That's like a 1,000 standard deviation event, right? A 50% drop in two days. Bad, misleading information, so absolutely. I think you can look at sovereign companies, much like uh, sovereign countries, much like companies, in that you have an equity, Maybe hard to measure it. I think, for example, the U.S. Part of the reason our interest rates are low right now is that we actually have rather a lot of equity in our political franchise. Regardless of what we think of it, it's probably better than you know, a communist dictatorship. My favorite place right now to look for, and by the way, with black swans, you don't want to you know jump at every shadow or cry swan, right? It doesn't do any good to say, well, there's they're all over the place, right? So, but one place in the world I look right now is China. Because if I asked you, communist dictatorship, would you trust their numbers? The answer would be uh, maybe. Also, <laughs> there, there is some data from China that is symptomatic of underlying social tensions. Now, social tensions could be a huge causative variable. So you see China sometimes sounding a little bit belligerent and nationalistic. That's a sign that the leaders are nervous and need to rally the troops elsewhere. Even you also read about some protests and other things going on. I'm not saying what China is going to be a black swan, but I would say those are the kinds of agree uh, ingredients that could lead to some extreme outcomes uh, and it's something to be conscious of. Thank you. The question was about China. Should we look for negative consequences since there seems to be a huge glut of, of housing there? I am not a China expert. In fact, I barely know anything about China. But anybody who's familiar with, as you start to understand the principles here, you could say those are potential ingredients. My ex-colleague, Steve Roach, who's Morgan Stanley chairman, chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, puts a 40% probability on a global double dip this year 
due to a speed bump in China. And he's more of an, certainly more of an expert than I am. I think the answer there is we don't know for sure. One of the chapters in the book is about thinking through different scenarios probabilistically. Uh, the idea is that you may not be able to say that China is a black swan with 100% probability right now, but you could say there's a potentiality for it. And you monitor that and you adjust your view of the probabilities as new information arises. That's chapter two. Yes, sir. So the question is, could you avoid black swans by sticking with good companies and uh, avoiding bad companies, paying particular attention to the quality of the management in, in regards, not just to their execution skills, but also with respect to their honesty with which they communicate information. Um, the answer is, I, you know, the more time one spends on Wall Street, the more skeptical one becomes about things in general, I, I think, according to my wife anyhow. Um, the, uh, certainly there are some management teams that are more credible and others who are less credible. I, I don't think we can put unlimited stock in managers uh, because they have very strong incentives. And so, you know, you might say, why is this management team putting a positive spin on things? instead of being fully open. But if I already own the stock, I would say, why is this management team talking about risk? Why aren't they talking up my stock that I own? So I think generally managers are under incentive to be positive. And I hate to say it, but you know, again, going back to Countrywide, Countrywide was viewed as a great company. And so even great companies with good managers can make mistakes and therefore I think that that's part of the equation, but not the whole thing. I will say, understanding management incentive and management psychology is a huge underlying causal variable. And in chapter nine of the book, I talk about Sally May and their underlying management decisions. And in chapter seven or eight, I talk about MasterCard and some of their incentives and decisions. So understanding what management is up to is, is hugely important in making accurate forecasts. So, so before we take the next question, I just want to add a response to that. Um, if you think about our presentation yesterday by Keith Sharon, uh, the previous CFO, Dennis Dammerman and GE was, they used to actually state in their annual report that essentially they were managing earnings. Um, and so they were very proud of it to some extent uh, before it became uh, something that was not looked upon favorably by many people. And the stock price did pretty well for a long period of time because they were also doing a lot of other things that arguably people perceived their management as being fantastic. Since Jeff Immelt came in and Keith's been the CFO a little bit before and since then, um, you can make your judgment as to which management team you would ascribe your attributes to, uh, but the stock price hasn't done very well. So it's sort of an interesting problem when you're faced with it, you, I, I think you're right. If you can't trust management, walk away. But how you actually measure that or evaluate that is actually really a tough uh, situation. And, and how you layer that into the forecast. I mean, the countrywide is a really interesting example. Um, and the other thing I would just say is that, to the point that Ken was making, CEOs and CFOs have a very difficult time motivating a whole organization if they're looking at the negative side and sort of being pessimistic, which frankly sometimes they need to be. Uh, 
So th there's a lot of dynamics that I'm not a psychologist that make it a very difficult thing to do when you get into these very difficult macro in macro situations. Yeah. So let me make sure I understand your question. You're saying you like your models, so what is the alternative? Um, I mean, you know, this is have someone right. who's over optimistic and doesn't even know it, right. or uh, a model that you know is going to fail in certain situations because you know book values don't always represent well, reality. Uh, 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 can, can, can I can yeah, I just so phrase the question for yeah. you? Mm -hmm. um, are you saying throw away all models and just use judgment? Oh, goodness, no, no. Let me go back to my uh, frame. Back to this. This is what I'm saying. So let me ask you a question, sir. How do you know what variables to put into your models? How do you use data? How do you know what to rely on to build your judgments? I'm sorry, how do you know what, how would the data tell you what variables to put into your model? By variable, I mean a factor. How do you make your judgments? I, at least I can tell you how I build my model. I'm not sure most people can tell you actually in a rigorous way how they make their judgments. No, so let me, let me try and um, mediate well, hang on, this. Hang on, Trevor. You don't want to get in, in little psychodactyl you two. Uh, it's, a, it's a later <laughs> Yeah, but, but my, I. So, so my, my, um, my interpretation. By the way, I'm not a quant investor. I was yes. an English major. So, uh, and, and an accountant. But um, when I read um, accounts from people like David Shaw, who I'm not a quant, well, then then I guess that doesn't work. But you know, I guess my Peter the Peter question the question would be how do you select the variables that go into the models? I mean, a computer can search all historic data and develop a principal components, you know, analysis of all the potential causal variables, but that won't be useful if the causative variables in the future are different than the ones that have operated in the past. So what I would suspect, and what I'm trying to suggest here is not that, you know, modeling isn't right, but you couldn't use a computer to build a model from scratch without giving it any guidance, and I think the guidance that you give a computer often starts with an intuitive recognition of what is important, because by the way, I'm not saying that people should rely on intu intuition without any, I'm not saying that if you have an intuitive idea, you should immediately execute it, but 
the intuition is where you recognize causal variables, and those are the ones that you can then program into models. You can program them into models, and then you can make judgments about how things might interact. You know, eventually computers will be able to reason conceptually, but for now they can't do that. So um, that's all I was really trying to suggest. So, so I'm, I'm going to interrupt because I want to invoke my privilege. We also have yeah. run out of time. But I, I think that to – don't go away because the, the point that you were clashing at, I don't think you were saying something fundamentally different at one level, is you've got a choice as to which factors – you collect the data for to test the model and develop the model, et cetera, as opposed to just having a big black box and then do data mining. And I think that's what Ken was trying to. So yes. you did, you would have loan to value ratios, FICO scores, et cetera, that you would build into a quantitative model and then use that and back test it and everything to get the fact. I'm not saying you do it, but that's, I think, where the starting point of this train was. And then the question is, do you accept it blindly or do you apply intuition or judgment on top of it? I think what I'm trying to say one thing to say I'm going to go buy cheap stocks, right? Um, it's another thing to actually have to sit down and program and decide what do you mean by cheap, right? Mm -hmm. Do you mean book value to price? Do you mean price to earnings? Do you mean on a relative basis? Do you mean on a, um, you know, cost? I mean, how are you time series basis? What are you, when you don't have to actually program a computer, you're allowed to be very, very fuzzy in your thinking. Um, judgments when you actually have to sit down and do the work to say I'm going to go buy a cheap stock and program a computer to do it you must be much much more precise and you must then be able to test what you actually mean and how that does uh, over a time series and I would rather take that any day than just having some manager come and tell me I'm going to go buy a cheap stock okay great so that is a perfect introduction to Mark Bradshaw's presentation <laughs> and the next uh, set of presentations we're going to see after the break.